united Arab nation stretching from the Atlantic to the Persian Gulf. Yes, it is our duty and our historical duty to achieve the Arab unity. And it is our right, as uh, you did in uh, America. Gaddafi may have already started to make his dream a reality. In January, his tanks drove across a thousand miles of desert to neighboring Chad to end the civil war, presumably at the invitation of the government. Less than a month ago, when Gaddafi visited that country, his troops were still there and in control. The Libyan himself was greeted as a liberator. Chad represents two important assets to Gaddafi, large uranium deposits and a strategic location from which he's able to threaten other weak and vulnerable countries like Niger, Mali, Mauritania, Morocco, the Western Sahara, and Tunisia. The Sudan has openly accused Libya of planning to invade. Do you plan to attack Sudan? <laughs> what for? Why we attack Sudan? <laughs> no, it has no any intention towards uh, Sudan or any other country out of the borders of uh, Chad. Then why, ask his neighbors, does Gaddafi continue to build such a large military force? One that could eventually be the largest in Africa or the Middle East. An army of more than a half a million people. What he's aiming at, eventually, is a military force that will be made up of every able-bodied man and woman in Libya. In the cities, men up to 45 years of age are obliged to spend two hours in training every day. These are learning to fire Soviet artillery. Teenagers still in school are required to learn about desert warfare. And a rare sight in a Muslim country, women soldiers. At this military academy, they become officers, then train other women around Libya. Except this group. They're going to a foreign land. They're members of the Polisario, the organization fighting Morocco for control of the Western Sahara. Interesting, because Colonel Gaddafi insists Libya does not train foreign soldiers. But does he use them? It's reported there are 5,000 Soviet military men currently in Libya, although they do stay out of sight. Western intelligence sources claim the Soviets fly some of Gaddafi's warplanes. So it's believed do Cubans and East Germans. Gaddafi denies this. He says they're only instructors and insists Libya will never become a communist base. We sacrifice it for their freedom and uh, independence. We will not uh, sell our independence and our soil for any to anyone in the world. However, Gaddafi does depend on Moscow for the bulk of his weapons, and Gaddafi pays cash, much of it, ironically, with dollars he gets from the United States for Libyan oil. It's reported he has tried to get some American weapon systems illegally through former CIA agents and even used Green Beret veterans for military training. Neither effort amounted to much. What might amount to something is Gaddafi's ominous interest in atomic power. Intelligence sources say he could have his own bomb within two years, and it's known the Soviets are building a nuclear power plant for him. Equally alarming is the contract he has with a West German company, which is testing rockets in the Libyan desert. Rockets that could reach Cairo, Tel Aviv, and even southern Europe. He argues this arsenal is only for self-defense, and he's obviously anxious to change the image he has, especially the association with international terrorism. He's been linked with the IRA, the Bada Meinhof gang in Germany, Palestinian extremists, and others. At one time, he welcomed hijackers and gave them haven. Three months ago, he refused to permit a hijacked Pakistani airliner to land. He points out Libya is one of the few countries with laws against terrorism. Allahu Akbar. Gaddafi insists his motives are peaceful and based on Islamic morality. But at the same time, he seems to be preparing for war. Who is the real Gaddafi? Some think he's a madman. Others call him a prophet. Many consider him a threat that must be stopped. However, for the moment, there does not seem to be anything or anyone standing in the way of this remarkable man from the desert. It's not a very friendly place, the desert. And for some countries, neither is Libya very friendly. But everyone is being forced to agree now that liked or disliked, this country and its leader, Colonel Gaddafi, have become powers that must be taken seriously. This is Luciapi, ABC News, in the Libyan desert. Good evening. United States warplanes were engaged in warfare today.
It lasted only about one minute, but that was long enough for two U.S. Navy planes to shoot down two Libyan jets after, according to the United States, they were attacked by the Libyan aircraft. Tonight, a full account of the military action and its implications, including a report from Libya. First, here is Pentagon correspondent David Ensor. The incident took place as the U.S. 6th Fleet was on maneuvers in this area of the southern Mediterranean. Two Navy F-14 Tomcats are flying on patrol about 60 nautical miles from Libyan beaches. That's well north of the three-mile territorial limit recognized by the U.S., but well south of the roughly 200-mile limit claimed by Libya's Colonel Gaddafi. Suddenly, U.S. pilots pick up two dots on their radar screens, which turn out to be two Libyan Soviet-made Su-22 fighters headed straight for them. There have been 40 Libyan sorties into the U.S. exercise area, but this time, one Libyan pilot fires a missile. The F-14 pilots switch on jamming radar to confuse it, and they veer to avoid being hit. The pilots quickly agree who will go after which plane and shoot both Libyan craft out of the sky. One Libyan pilot is seen parachuting into the sea. The other is presumed dead. Word of the fighting is flashed back to the Pentagon within six minutes, and hasty arrangements are made for Defense Secretary Weinberger to give the American version of events. We regard these as international waters. We've uh, had uh, naval and air exercises there before, uh, and uh, this one was uh, scheduled for some time, and the notification went out in the perfectly normal fashion. The normal fashion is notices to airmen and mariners sent by teletype and radio, and certainly, officials say, received loud and clear by the Libyans. In Tripoli, the official Libyan news agency was deploring the American maneuvers at sea as being provocative and a possible plot with Egypt to invade Libya, even before the fighter planes clashed offshore. After the aerial combat, Libya called it an act of aggression and gave a sharply different account of what happened. Greg Dobbs is in Tripoli with details. Libya claims it was American planes that shot first and not the Libyans, and in fact doesn't even say whether the Libyan fighters actually fired at all. Furthermore, there were, by Libya's account, eight American jets against its two. Libya says that in view of this morning's incident, Libya reserves the right to take all actions which may seem necessary to it to protect its rights in the future. Good evening. It sounds incredible, but it may be true. Libya's strongman, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, may have ordered the assassination of President Reagan and other top Washington officials. And a Libyan hit squad may be in this country tonight, bent on carrying out those orders. Anti-sniper teams look down from the roof of the White House. Top presidential aides suddenly show up with Secret Service protection. Security forces assigned to senior cabinet officers increase in size and vigilance. The vice president's motorcade, once so unassuming, begins including decoy automobiles and a special weapons squad. The president's airplane is fitted with devices designed to prevent missile attacks. Suddenly, official Washington assumes a virtual state of siege. Because of this man, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. He's an egomaniac who would trigger World War III to make the headlines. He's the world's principal terrorist and trainer of terrorists. And he's the protector of the likes of Idi Amin, and he's dangerous to Egypt, to Israel, and he's dangerous to peace. Relations between the two countries have gone sour since the Reagan administration took office. In May, Libyan diplomats were ordered to leave Washington because, said the State Department, of Colonel Gaddafi's wide range of provocation.